I have in front of me an Apple IIc, which is ailing. Now, if this were another 8-bit computer, I'm not sure I would rush to do much to save it. The ZX Spectrum, for instance, is such a dreadfully boring machine that I'd rather give mine away than risk further damage to repair it. However, I've become very attached to the Apple II. Uh, it has a remarkable amount of good software, especially given its age, and this one is in really good condition, so I'd really prefer to bring it back to life with my own two hands. Now, I'll tell you ahead of time that the problem is in the RAM, uh, which I've already thoroughly diagnosed, but I'll show you how I reached that conclusion. You can see here that when I turn the machine on, it more or less boots up, uh, reads from the disk, and you can see there's software on the screen here. But this isn't consistent. I'll show you some footage I shot earlier where I boot up the game Airheart. Uh, it gets to the Quack intro screen no problem, but when I proceed to the next screen, suddenly the graphics are totally trashed and the machine freezes. If we roll back for a moment, notice that right before the Airheart splash screen appears, there are some exclamation points just hanging out in space. While the Apple II is known for having gibberish on the screen at times, these ones aren't normal, and more importantly, they show up in other programs too. For instance, if I launch ProDOS, those same exclamations show up on the menu, and they definitely shouldn't be there. I can then try to do virtually anything, like verify a disk image, and it'll crash to a debugger, which obviously shouldn't happen. All this behavior points very strongly to bad RAM, and fortunately on the 2C this isn't hard to prove, as long as you don't have one with the very earliest ROM they released. Uh, there's a method I'll put in the description on how to check that. On all ROMs after the original, by simply turning the machine on while holding both Apple keys, it will boot directly into a built-in RAM test. Now in the footage that I shot earlier, you can see it says RAM 0000100, but on the television screen that I have in front of me right now, I just did this, and it's only the very last one that's lit up. And right before I shot this video, I did it, and it was the last three digits that were lit up. So this indicates that the problem is at or near chip number three. Uh, this is actually a, uh, a graphical layout showing you which position the bad chip is in. But if a chip is bad, it can cause a sort of cascade failure where the RAM test thinks that that chip and every chip after it is bad. Uh, I've actually never seen it do just the last one, so it's possible there's something wrong with the third chip that's intermittent, or that there's something wrong with the last three chips, or, or something else entirely. But either way, there's definitely something going on with the RAM chips, and it's limited to the auxiliary RAM. Uh, there's two banks of RAM in the Apple II, uh, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, and the asterisk uh, at the left end here next to RAM means this is in the auxiliary RAM. Just to be certain, I ran another memory test from Mech, and this one comes back and says the auxiliary RAM needs repair, so uh, although this one doesn't say which chip it is, uh, it still confirms that there's something wrong in the auxiliary RAM. So our problem is pinpointed. So all I should have to do is pull, hopefully, just the third chip and replace it, uh, and that's pretty straightforward with these things. So I'm going to do that, and I'll, I'll do it up like a tutorial so you can follow along in case you're doing this yourself. Uh, and here's hoping I succeed, and that way you can succeed. So I already opened the chassis on this, uh, and the uh, screws are already out, but I'll show you where they are. The ones you're going to want to remove are going to be here, 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 and here. You'll want to leave these ones, at least some of them, in. They hold in the floppy drive, and you don't want that coming up with the case top. You'll want to start at the front of the case, and you're going to need some sort of stiff plastic thing. Uh, you'll just want to lift up the front cover here, slip that in there, and just slide it over. And it'll just pop this tab here. Now, if you lift straight up right now, you'll break the case. You've got to get it over the ports at the back and over the floppy drive. You'll see that it catches here. You want to lift up until it pops over that. And then from the back here, lift up, pull back. And it'll come right off. You'll probably want to take this handle out or it'll fall out when you least expect it. Now you need to take the floppy drive out, but before that, you'll want to take the keyboard out or it'll fall out when you flip the machine over. So you flip the front up so this tab can come out of the floppy drive cage, and then you'll want to take the cable out of the motherboard. And that's keyed, so you can't get it back in wrong. And now you can flip this up. I'll take this last screw out. When removing the floppy drive, you want to make sure this very tiny cable here comes out of the board. Uh, if you bend the pins on the drive, you're in trouble, and you don't want to unplug it from the drive because you can get it misaligned at that end, but you can't get it misaligned at the board end. It's a little sticky getting the drive out because it's sort of wedged in here, so you just have to, there you go, pop it loose, and then pop that cable loose there, and there you go. All right, so we have a very clear view of the board, and these are all the RAM chips down here at the bottom, so let's get in there. The RAM here is laid out very straightforward, uh, with the first eight being the main RAM chips and the next eight being the auxiliary RAM chips. 
uh, the labels down here. M means main, uh, and then the digit identifies the chip. A means auxiliary. So very easy to find one you're looking for. Now, this, of course, is where things get a little iffy. Uh, from the RAM test, uh, it's supposedly chip 3, but I'm not sure which chip 3 it is. I know it's in the auxiliary section, but is it chip 3 from this end or chip 3 from that end? I read a few things online and even a couple of books. Imagine that. Uh, but it wasn't super clear to me which one was which. Um, I think, however, that it's this one here. It's the third one in from the keyboard end. So that's why I'm not going to just desolder this chip and solder a new one in. Instead, I'm going to put in a socket. Because uh, A, I'm not sure this chip is bad, and if I can salvage it and it turns out it isn't bad, I'm going to want to reuse it. And B, I don't know if the chips that I have are actually good. I literally know full in this is the chip supply that I have. Uh, I've never seen this bin before. I just found it in my storage unit. I don't even think it's mine. Are they good? I don't know. If they're not, I don't want to have a bad chip soldered in there and have to heat the board up again to take it out. You know, this board's nearly 40 years old, and I could destroy the traces in the process, making it impossible to ever fix it. A socket is definitely the safer bet. Now, I have sockets, that's not a problem, but they're the high-profile variety, uh, which I'm told could be problematic in here, uh, because uh, the floppy drive sits right over where the RAM chips go, uh, and there's things hanging down, so if the chip that I replace with a socketed one sticks up further and runs into something here, we'll have a problem. But uh, I saw somebody else try this, and they were pretty lucky and, and didn't run into anything, and I, I think my chip is in roughly the same spot, so I'm going to give it a shot and hope for the best. Let me just get a good ground for my anti-static strap. This electrical conduit should do. I'm going to have to pull what I assume is the power supply. I actually uh, have not looked this up, but it seems most likely. I wonder... I'm not sure if that's how I was supposed to do that. I just tilted it up. I, it didn't feel right, but okay. Yeah, that's the power supply. Good. And the rest of this looks pretty straightforward. Screw, 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 screw. Screw. Another screw up here by the speaker. Unplug the speaker while I'm at it. And another screw here. Oh, there's a screw. There's still a screw. There it is. These mesh donuts are going to come off while you're disassembling it uh, because they're sitting on these posts the board has to come off of. And it's important to get them back in the right spot because they ground the floppy cage. Uh, and if you don't remember which one's which, it's the ones with the ground planes underneath. See, there's nothing here or here uh, for the mesh to touch. So they go there and there. Okay, it looks like we're free. Eh, eh. This post up here is tenacious. There we are. You know, this won't fit in my pan of ice board clamp. Oh, what a pain. If the edges of the board were flat, I could put it in my big pan of ice clamp, but I can't, so I'm just going to have to figure something out. Overall, as I was saying, it's in really good condition. Uh, there's uh, kind of a light layer of dust, but in general, it looks fantastic. Now, one thing I need to do is to make sure that I take out the right chip. Uh, my brain's really bad at 3D geometry, so when I flip this over, I'm going to forget which chip is which. So since I'm convinced that it's the third one, uh, one, two, three. It's this one that says nine on it. So I'm actually going to make uh, just a little light mark here and then flip the board over right in the middle of those marks. So it's that one. And if I didn't do that, I would take out the wrong damn one. Now, everyone with experience with these machines uh, highly advises that you be very careful removing chips. Uh, everything you do with soldering on these old boards uh, can be problematic, but uh, particularly on like the ZX Spectrum and C64, the board quality is very, very low, uh, even for the era, so those are just hellish to work on. Now, this, I think, is a much higher quality board than those machines use, but I still have to be careful with it. So I'm going to add a little bit of solder to each of the pads for this chip and then use the solder pump to try and pull it off. Uh, and if that doesn't work, I'm going to try carefully to use the solder braid to get the last little bits so I can actually move the chip intact, uh, which can be done if you're very, very careful. I'm not sure whether I'm good enough, but I can be careful, so I'm going to give it a shot. As I've said before, the reason I'm adding solder is because the old solder is hinky. I don't really know why, but it's just hinky. Old solder is just strange. You add a little bit of solder, and the old stuff just gets much nicer to work with. You know what? I forgot to turn on my fume extractor, so it's going to get a lot louder now. Okay, those all have nice fresh solder on them now, so I'm going to give it a shot.
Okay, all those came up pretty clean except this one in the back, which we'll just try one more time. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's see if we can just pop that out. Okay, well most of it came out, uh, except for uh, this end, which is where we had the trouble getting it fully released. So I'm just going to press that back in and give it one more shot. That looks a lot cleaner, although I might need to just push that a little bit away for it to release. Okay, let's see what we got. And there you go. Uh, completely clean extraction. Didn't have to clip the leads off or anything. And I applied very little heat to the board, so I'm quite confident that I didn't damage any traces. Since our holes are clean, it should be straightforward to just uh, drop the socket right in there. And there it is. I'll just use a little bit of off-brand Kapton tape to hold it in place. I don't know how to pronounce that name. I'm doing a second pass because I don't feel like I got enough solder in any of these holes the first time around. All right, there we go. Let's clean that up a bit. Just gonna use some isopropyl alcohol here. Okay, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not the best repair tech and I didn't clean that flux up very well. By the way, there's all the solder I pulled off the board, quite a bit. I have to say, this is the first major project that I've used this guy on. This is the Engineer SS02 solder sucker. Uh, they make a larger version of it as well, which I'm thinking I might get at some point. But this one worked really, really nice, and the build quality is wonderful. The whole thing is, is machined aluminum, and uh, it's got this uh, silicone tube on the tip so that you're not just pressing a hard plastic thing down against the board. You're, you're actually making a seal. Uh, and I think that's a big reason why I was able to get those holes uh, so clear. I'm actually going to put a link to this in the description. It's not a, an affiliate link or anything. I just, uh, this thing is amazing and I didn't know that they existed. And the company that makes them makes a whole bunch of really cool looking tools. Like seriously, I'm not shilling. This thing's just incredible. Now, the acid test here is, is the floppy drive going to fit? So I figured there was no better way to find out than to just try it. So what I thought was a, a peg here binding is actually... This uh, headphone jack binds on the chassis right there. It runs into the plastic, so you actually have to tilt the board, slip that in, and then flip it down. It's actually quite the maneuver. There we go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take this captain tape off. This is actually, I'm not joking here, so this, this stuff you've seen inside LCDs and stuff, if you've ever seen someone take apart like a, a fairly modern piece of electronics, you'll see this amber tape everywhere. Uh, 3M makes it, and it's called Capton or, or Captain Film, something like that. It's a polyamide uh, plastic. I don't know what its properties are, but it's just very popular in electronics use, so I, I figured I'd get some because no other tape seemed appropriate. Uh, but I can't afford Capton tape. It's incredibly expensive. So I got this stuff for like $5, and this is a uh, Coptan tape. I'm not joking. They just swapped the valves. So I'm going to get one of my new chips here. New is a very strong term. Now, the chip I have here is an M5K... 4164 AP. Um, this appears to be a Mitsubishi part, if I'm if I'm seeing that logo correctly, and this is not the same as the parts that are in here. These ones are MT, which is a different manufacturer, and they're 4264. And everything I've been told is that the 4164 and 4264 are basically interchangeable uh, for this purpose. Uh, so hopefully that was correct. I mean, the worst case scenario is it doesn't work, and I've got to order 4264s, which is the boat I was in anyway. I hate how new chips they come with the legs kind of fanned out a lot of the times. So you got to kind of push them in before they'll sock it in. Really irritating, but I, I, I think it's to make it easier to solder them. Okay, that's seated, and it looks like the key is facing the right direction. So let's try that floppy drive. Yeah, with the drive where it's supposed to go, that spindle would encroach on this if it's actually in the correct lateral position, so hopefully it isn't. Looks like the spindle is centered side to side, so with this upside down, it's in the same lateral position as it would be right side up, and... If I set this in here, it looks like, yeah, I think it's going to miss. I, I think it'll be okay. So let's see if this feels like it'll seat. Oh, that, that feels okay. 
I don't think there's a problem. I think it'll be all right. So I don't have any of the screws in the main board, but I'm just going to pop the power supply in, fire this thing up, and, and see what happens. Okay, so we're cabled and ready to fire it up. And let's remember, uh, the options here are it doesn't work, it throws more RAM errors, it doesn't get better, or uh, we get a great big pop from under the floppy drive. You know what? I'm going to take the floppy drive out, because I don't need a floppy drive right now. And I don't want that chip to explode into the bottom of the floppy drive if I installed it backwards. There's thinking with your ass. Okay, here we go. Okay, and since there's no keyboard installed, it went straight into the RAM test. Uh, that is intended, and it's not totally dead. The chip isn't exploding. Let's see what happens. And we're getting the same error. <laughs> well, at least it's not worse. So my theory is I think that it's this RAM chip, not the RAM chip here. And we're still getting the exclamation marks. So, yeah, I definitely didn't touch the chip uh, that was damaged because if I had, the failure mode would have changed. So we're definitely having exactly the same problem. Uh, the good news is that I didn't destroy the good chip. Uh, otherwise, my RAM test would have failed in a different location. So I think we're good to, to go ahead and uh, replace uh, this chip up here now. A tip, by the way, if you heat from this side of the pin, where it's the direction it's bent over in, it doesn't seem to work nearly as well at getting the hole empty as if you heat from the back side of it. So you have to heat from here and then hit it. All right, well, that looks clean as hell, except maybe for this one up here. I'm not sure I trust it, uh, and I don't want to bend it. So I'm going to do that one more time. Just let that soak in. Then hit it again. Oh, much better. Now to get to start coming out, it does require a little bit of persuasion with a screwdriver. You just have to very carefully get it in there without wedging it too hard against the board where you might damage a, a trace. So you can brace on this little yellow component here if you're not, you know, this is very little force here, right? We're not, we're not prying. We're just, we're just the gentlest little bit of persuasion and then it starts coming up. Ouch. Whoops. Well, I munged the chip a little bit. Look at that. All those holes are completely clear. Second verse, same as the first. Okay, this should just drop in. Let's see what surprise chips we have in the bag today. Okay, looks like this is another, maybe Mitsubishi. Not gonna Google the part number. Too much work. Oh, shit. Can you believe that? Can you believe I did that? I can't believe I did that. Good lord. It was another one. Same part number, 4164. Let's give it a shot. Make sure I get the one side really in there. Then bend the other one in. Okay. We're looking good. We're nice and straight. Let's just... Hmm. Is there something wrong with that socket? It almost feels like it's hitting something. Oh, hell's bells. That socket is blocked. It's not my fault. This one I'll keep. Let's see if I can fix. I don't see nothing down there. I'm looking at the bottom of a socket, and it doesn't look like it's possible to over-solder it such that it would uh, block it from moving. This looks pretty solid on the bottom, so I don't think it could be my fault. I think it's just a faulty socket, which is a damn shame, because I don't want to take it back out and make this board go through another desoldering cycle. So, shh, what am I going to do? I found another 4164 in the box, and I'm going to install that. But I'm just going to push it about halfway in so I don't bend that pin. Feels like I got good contact. Okay, and we're back to where we started, uh, 111 at the far end. So, yeah, I think what I was originally reading uh, was correct, and this one really is uh, the third position. Okay, so this suggests that the problem really is in... Uh, the first two chips here, uh, maybe this one's fine and these ones had problems, or, or otherwise one of these chips is messed up. So I'm going to continue working in from the uh, from the sides here because uh, I don't want to replace the ones in the middle where the motor spindle might be. Uh, so I'm really hoping it's one of the ones out here. And if I end up with them all socketed, that's not really the end of the world. Oh, much better. 
Ah, very good. I have made an egregious error. There's a reason you're not supposed to use a screwdriver for this purpose. I have slipped and gouged the board, and if I'm very, very, very lucky, I didn't hit any traces. I gouged it real good, but it looks like I might not have broken through the solder resist. So, maybe no damaged conductors. We might be okay. But that was just dumb of me. There's, there's no excuse for using a metal tool for this sort of thing. It was just a stupid idea. Let's try it again. Why not? What do we have to lose? It's been going for quite a while now. It's never run this long before without giving an error. I've never seen it do that before, that, that rapid fire flickering. I don't know if that's a normal part of the RAM test. Maybe that means it succeeded and it's doing another another run. I have no idea. It's not failing, so let's give it some software. Oh, the exclamation points are gone. Hey, that's the game. The floppy emu is uh, chugging. Whoa! Hey, that did it! I fixed it! What? That's genuine surprise you hear in my voice. I didn't think this was going to work. Okay, I'm going to swap this out for another piece of diagnostic software. Here's Mech Computer Inspector again. And yeah, we're on a RAM test. So there we go. The problem was in chip one, and it just rippled to the next two chips. Okay, well, this is fantastic, and I'm super thrilled. Um, but I'd better get this situation resolved so I can button this thing up and actually use it. Very important question we need to answer. Uh, now that I've installed these in all these positions, will this fit? Yeah, yeah it feels pretty good. Just going to fire it up and see if the disc can rotate and all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, looks like it works perfectly. So uh, it looks like those chips and those sockets are okay. Wow. A bunch of pins came out of the socket and just stayed in the board. Fun. Oh, lovely, folks. You love to see it. Uh, that right there is a blown trace uh tore it tore it right off the board completely shredded uh that awful socket everything else i did here was was barbarian but worked out but that awful socket when i took it out just just ripped a, a trace clear off the board all right so after a lot of cussing i now have two bodge wires in here to replace the traces i blew uh, i'm going to install a new dip socket and if it's in good health then we'll be able to button this thing up and get it working No exclamations. And there's Earhart. Wow. <laughs> Despite my barbarian repair job, I, I had to replace three chips when I only needed to do one. I've had them in and out five times. This whole thing was just so barbaric. And yet, I seem to have come out on top somehow. I don't deserve to have, but I have. <laughs> Holy crap. I can't believe it's working. And that's a clean bill of health. Wow. Wow! I, I can't believe it. <laughs> After all that back and forth, I did it. I can't believe I fixed this thing using a pile of parts I found in a box that had been there for who knows how long, and all the times I had my hands in there. I mean, how did I not, even with the strap, I mean, I can't believe that I didn't static shock anything else. Let's just get it all buttoned back up. gonna slow down for a moment to explain something this is the apple floppy emu um, i'll put a link in the description to where you can get one of those um, these things are, are fantastic and uh, the reason i'm mentioning it is because uh, i need to hook this up uh, in place of the internal floppy drive because i don't really have very many discs for this right now and i'm just gonna feed it through this hole here but it's gonna look very weird when i'm done so i didn't want you to be confused by that but just so you know if you do get one of these you want to use it as the primary drive you could just feed it through the hole here and uh, plug it in where the floppy drive normally goes and then you can just cinch it up and it'll very happily come out right above 
where the floppy connector is. It doesn't get in the way or anything. Well, it looks like everything worked out. I'm running the machine all buttoned up now. AppleSoft is working, as you can see here, and I can launch Airheart, Arkanoid, Frogger, and other games that have on my SD card. The machine seems perfectly happy. I'm still shocked it survived the ordeal I put it through. I know that to some extent it's not unusual for repair on old computers to involve some mucking around like this and even the odd broken trace, but it's still a huge bummer that I caused those problems myself. I'd really intended to be gentle with this thing, but I guess there's only so much you can do. The biggest lesson learned was not to be impatient. The dip sockets I used were trash, and I, I think I knew they were trash, but I wanted to get the job done now, not wait a few days for quality components to arrive. Now that I've worked with them, I understand what makes them low quality, and I'll never touch this design of dip socket again. I'm not sure how much value this video has as an instructional tool, but I hope if you're repairing a 2C of your own that you have as much luck as I did, so you can continue enjoying this machine as much as I hope to. They're wonderful little computers that deserve to live as long as they possibly can. Even if you were just here for entertainment, though, thanks for watching.